Hello everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Daily Gray Refuel, where we recap the latest news in the Ethereum ecosystem. I'm your host, Anthony Sassano, and today's the 24th of August, 2021. All right, everyone, let's get into it. So really, a bunch of really exciting news from the Ethereum Foundation today. So they announced today that uh, seven or six different projects here have donated $250,000 each to support uh, various Ethereum client teams. So these projects, or I guess like entities, include Compound through the Compound Grants Program, uh, Kraken, the obviously the exchange, Lido, the staking provider or liquid staking provider, Synthetics, the, you know, everyone knows Synthetics, one of the DeFi, top DeFi protocols, uh, the Graph, uh, Middleware Protocol and Uniswap, um, obviously another DeFi protocol there. Now this money is on top of the money that the Ethereum Foundation already kind of uses to fund these clients and the clients that it's going towards are ETH1 clients or as the Ethereum Foundation says here in their tweet, execution layer clients, which I'll get back to in a sec. These clients include our Aragon, uh, Nimbus, Go, uh, Go Ethereum, uh, Geth, um, and Nethermind and Hyperledger Basu. So a bunch of different clients here, really, really cool to see. But I did want to kind of just uh, point out kind of what they mean by execution layer here. So some of you may have seen this kind of uh, terminology being used before, uh, but like just if, if you haven't, I, I want to break it down. So essentially in, I guess like today with the fact that we have two kind of like uh, blockchains running that are called Ethereum, right? We have ETH1 and ETH2. ETH1 being the chain we all know and love and use today. ETH2 being the beacon chain, the one that we stake on, the one that doesn't really do anything except uh, have staked ETH on it uh, just yet. Now, uh, once the merge happens, we're going to obviously merge these two networks together and then they're going to be operating um, uh, basically in harmony, but still they're going to be split off into what's called the execution layer and the consensus layer. Now, the execution layer is essentially... I mean, as the name implies, the layer that handles all the execution of the smart contracts, processing transactions, all the stuff we already do on ETH1 today. And that will, that will be run by the existing ETH1 clients that we all use, like Geth or Aragon or whatever else you use there. Uh, then there's the uh, consensus layer, which is basically the layer that runs the beacon chain. So, you know, Prism, Lighthouse, Teku, all those clients and, and stuff like that, they're on the consensus layer. So whenever you see this terminology used, this is basically a, a replacement for the ETH1, ETH2 terminology. Execution layer being ETH1, consensus layer being ETH2. And then once they're merged together, that's that's kind of like how we're looking at it. And it's, it's, it's the reason it's been done this way is to, I guess, like simplify uh, a lot of this stuff for the researchers and developers and for the ecosystem to kind of know what, uh, you know, the, the separation of concerns between the two. So you have like the consensus layer, obviously um, comes, to, comes to consensus on the stuff that's being executed on the execution layer, but they're, they're distinctly separate so that there's less complexity within the clients as well. And they you know, you don't have to rebuild all the clients to handle both things and, you know, introduce security bugs and all that sort and all those sorts of things there. So that's kind of like what that means and I just think, you know, on that note, I just think it's really, really cool to see that we have ecosystem projects donating what is a total of, I think, one point, uh, what is it, one point seven five million dollars, if I'm doing my math correctly here. Uh, probably, uh, yeah, yeah, I think it's about that, or maybe one point five million or something like that. My math's off there, um, but essentially, uh, you know, th this is on top of what the Ethereum Foundation already kind of like gives to these teams in funding, um, and you know, there's other kind of like, I guess, funding uh, uh, things out there like. Um, like a uh, Gitcoin grants, right? The matching grants, some of these clients are in there and they get uh, they get uh, kind of like money for that. And there's, I think there's a various other ways these teams kind of like get funding as well. So yeah, just really, really cool to see this and cool to see these teams come together, especially someone like Kraken, right? I mean, Kraken is a centralized exchange, but they've been supporting Ethereum for a very long time. Like you may not know this, but they were the first exchange to list ETH uh, back in the day in, in 2015 when the Ethereum network went live, Coinbase didn't list it, I think until a year after or something like that. Um, they are one of the top holders of ETH, one of the top stakers as well. Um, and, you know, they've just been very supportive of the Ethereum ecosystem over the years. So great to see that. And of course, all the other ones, I mean, pretty much all these projects are built on Ethereum or using Ethereum. Uh, Lido is, is a relatively new entrant, uh, entrant here over the last few months, but it's quickly become one of the top uh, stakers. And a lot of people seem to love using Lido as well. So yeah, great to see all of this from uh, the kind of like these, these teams here. And on that note as well, uh, Geth has a new version out. So if you want run the Geth client, this one fixes a security vulnerability in all live versions of Geth. So all Geth users will need to update. So if you're running the client, definitely go uh, give yourself an update here. So there's been a bit of drama and I haven't spoken about this on the refuel yet. I did kind of 
touch on it on the uh, AMA over the weekend, but I did want to talk about it on the on the refuel. So there's drama about uh, around this project called um, the kind of like Eagle Token or kind of like EGL as you may have seen it. So what this project kind of like aims to do is essentially attach a token or monetary incentive to uh, or like a signaling mechanism to uh, the gas limit system. So for those of you who don't know, the gas limit is essentially what we refer to um, in Ethereum as the block size. So the gas limit right now is, uh, I guess it's a, it's a 15 million kind of limit, but 30 million, I mean, technically 30 million because of one five five nine. Um, uh, but like 15 million is kind of like the target. Uh, I won't, I won't kind of explain that. It's a, it's a little bit kind of like complex to explain. If you want to read about that, you can, you can go back to my newsletter on EIP one five five nine, the daily way there and, and check that out. Um, just have to Google for it, um, but yeah, essentially what this what this kind of like token was uh, was created to do was uh, allow for you know people to kind of like signal to miners, hey, you know we want the gas limit to be voted up uh, up or down, or like to increase or decrease, and that's because the miners have the ability to increase or decrease the gas limit, aka Ethereum's block size. Now they've exercised this ability multiple times in the past, and normally it's a it's a function of you know it, do the community does the community want it? Is there rough consensus on it? And do the core devs sign off on it? Because because the gas limit or block size, I guess, uh, I guess I should say, is not something that should be increased um, lightly. It's not something that you can just increase willy nilly. And it's for the same reasons that you know some of you may may know about uh, with Bitcoin and their block size war. You know, the the, the kind of like. Um, the, the more you increase the block size or the, or the gas limit in Ethereum, the, I guess, more uh, you increase the hardware requirements to run a full node, and then you, I guess, like lower decentralization. So for example, if you were to increase the gas limit from 15 million, uh, the, the, sorry, the target limit from 15 million today to 100 million, essentially what you're doing is you're you're basically making it much harder to one, uh, run full nodes, and you need more kind of like beefy uh, hardware to run that. You're also making it harder for blocks to propagate around the network. So Essentially, obviously, these full nodes are set up all around the world, uh, and you know miners are set up all around the world, so they have to propagate blocks to each other and talk to each other and communicate. And the higher the gas limit, the harder that is to do because uh, the longer it takes for blocks to travel I and mean, propagate through the network, right? Um, and on top of that, you know, depending on the client, they they probably they aren't, aren't optimized to handle the load of that increased gas limit, so the clients may fall out of sync, and the uncle rewards may go up, which is basically uncle uncle rewards are given to uh, uh, p- uh to miners who mine a block that isn't included in the canonical chain because it came in slightly slower than, uh, than another chain uh, than, than another block so, uh, sorry um, and they're kind of rewarded for that work but they're not kind of part of the the main chain the canonical chain as we call it um, and you know those increase and when you have too many uncle blocks it means that the chain stability uh, uh, incre- uh, tra- chain instability I should say increases and you may have a network split at some point so there's a lot of good reasons why you don't want to tinker with the gas limit uh, too much here um, but you know the reason why there's drama around EGL is because it seems like the creators of this blocks route, the company is called, believe that they can put this decision into the hands of, I guess, like the community and essentially uh, a hope that they come together on kind of consensus with this. Uh, and, you know, it's a way, it's also a way to kind of like bribe uh, the miners. So Tim Biker had a, a few good threads about this, breaking it down better than I can. But essentially, I mean, he says here that uh, it's not a serious threat to Ethereum. It's not going to kill or seriously damage Ethereum. And I don't think so either. Uh, uh, You know, really, at the end of the day, it's just like an attempt at kind of pseudo on-chain governance on Ethereum, which isn't going to be st- stood for. Like, no, you know, most people I've spoken to say that this is just a really bad idea uh, for, the, for the same reasons I kind of like outlined. But on top of that, um, you know, Ethereum doesn't have on-chain governance, right? There are other other kind of chains that do. I think Polkadot is like the prime example here of a chain that has like binding on-chain governance where everything's handled through votes and stuff like that. And I mean, we've seen this play out with a lot of the DeFi apps on Ethereum. The governance systems aren't very good, right? So that's fine for like these apps and, and kind of like the app layer and everything like that. But ideally, you don't want the base layer that's supporting all of this sort of st- stuff running on, on an on-chain governance system. And I've always been against it for the base layer. I don't think it's the right path forward. And the way Ethereum governance works is much more complex than that. It's basically b- based on a rough consensus, which I-, I won't go into now, but it's like a whole process that the um, kind of like each upgrade has to go through. I mean, it, you know, just as an example, it took over two years for ERP-1559 to get in because you had to go through that whole process and get buy-in from different kind of like ecosystem participants, not literal kind of like buy-in with money, but like, you know, social buy-in and stuff like that. Um, and yeah, I-, I just think like introducing a token to vote on a specific parameter of Ethereum 
is just like a, a really kind of like bad idea. And I think Trent put it really well in his tweet here where he said, where he basically was mocking this EGL token. And, so, and basically in this tweet, he says, introducing peer, like peer token, a token to govern the networking settings between Ethereum nodes, introducing sync, a token to govern the parameters for syncing Ethereum nodes, introducing Q, a token to govern the execute queue for validators. Does everyone see how dumb this is? Now, essentially what he's saying here is that that's you know the EGL the EGL token is, is it has been introduced to govern one part of I guess like the Ethereum network so why not just introduce a token for each other part right like for each part of like the the protocol itself and it it just doesn't make any sense it, it really um you know it skews incentives it is it is very uh, toxic to the Ethereum ecosystem it can lead to bribing because what can end up happening is that people can bribe the I guess like miners to um with kind of like these EGL tokens or whatever to raise the gas limit. And then maybe the EGL tokens kind of increase in value and stuff like that. There's there's all kind of like weird stuff that goes on. And that's another reason why I'm against on-chain governance. Uh, but yeah, that's that's kind of like the drama that's been there. It's been a little bit hard to follow because there's a lot of different threads and, and kind of like, um, you know, intertwining through all of this. And, you know, there's there's a split in opinion between, you know, the Geth team and the Aragon team and stuff like that. So it's just a little bit ugly on, on Twitter. But I did, uh, hopefully I summarized it okay for all of you. But in general, general I, I really wouldn't worry at all about this EGL token and any kind of like security uh kind of like issues or like it, it's not going to kill Ethereum nothing like that right it's just it, it's definitely something that needs to be called out and the core devs have come out against it and at least most of them and said you know this is a really bad idea we don't support this and that's all well and good and you know if you take the super cynical approach here blocks route the the company's main product is actually something called a blockchain delivery network or a bdn um which it were which um is meant to help miners kind of propagate blocks faster through the network right so you see how going back to what i was saying before so if you can raise the gas limit higher and higher and then miners need this technology to keep up with the chain well then you kind of like uh, get them coming to blocks route and purchasing block route blocks routes technology or using their technology um for for this kind of like BDN stuff that they do. So you can see how there's just like a whole mess of incentives here where Blocksrout has an incentive for the gas limit to be increased. They introduce this EGL token so that they can kind of somehow get the community to buy into this and kind of like get that gas limit increase and then they can on sell their technology later. Uh, you know, that's just like taking the super cynical approach, but I don't think it's too far fetched. I don't think it's a conspiracy theory. Um, and you know, I guess props to to Uri from from Blocks, right? He's been in and out of all these threads, like um, discussing it quite nicely. He hasn't been toxic or anything like that. But I think there's just like a massive fundamental disagreement between what he wants and what the Ethereum community at large wants. So yeah, I mean, it goes without saying, I do not support EGL at all. I think it's a silly idea. Uh, but you know, in saying that, I do think that. The gas limit in general is maybe not something the miners should have control over, and there's a separate discussion to that happening within the community right now. But I also think that the you know the gas limit, at least the the um the kind of like decision on what you do with it or kind of like to increase or decrease it. I don't know if that's something you leave up to the kind of like wider community because it, as I mentioned before, there's so many different moving parts to it that really at the end of the day, I only trust the core devs to know what's best in that on that specific parameter um, and some, you know, key community members. I really don't trust just like the general kind of like Ethereum community member to know, you know, the, the intricate details of this sort of stuff. I wouldn't even trust myself, to be honest, to know what this would affect because it's definitely got to do with like core protocol um, stuff that's built directly into clients. And at the end of the day, the client teams know their tech they know what they've built they know what it can handle whereas community members like like me and you we just don't know have that level of detail or access to that level of detail we can learn if we want but still like we haven't coded it we haven't been around we haven't built the clients we haven't been around for years so i'd much rather kind of trust them and their opinions on this sort of stuff than trust uh you know just like a especially a group of uh, uh, of token holders like i just think that's the that's probably the worst way to go about it but yeah Hopefully that gives you a nice little overview of everything happening there. I'll, of course, link these tweet threads in the description. You can go check it out for yourself. All right, so Antonio, the founder of DYDX, put out this thread today highlighting all the different kind of metrics since DYDX launched their token. I guess the token's not technically launched yet because it's not trading, but you can earn rewards on the DYDX layer two exchange. And you've also got an airdrop waiting for you if you completed the criteria to, to get that airdrop. But I think it's going live like sometime next month. Um, but essentially he put out the highlights here and he said, daily trading volume is over $400 million for the first day and, and, and growing. Uh, 73,500 lifetime users, 34,000 added since the launch of DYDX token. 
$1.8 million in revenue per week and 6.5K uh, uh, weekly traders. Now, the reason why I wanted to highlight this was because you may have remembered like a few months ago on the refuel uh, when DYDX launched their layer two exchange, I was going through their growth, right? And I was saying, you know, I expect this to really explode. And I'm I'm pretty sure I mentioned back then that I expected it to explode, uh, especially when they launched their token. Because I mean, as I said multiple times, everyone's going to have a token. Um, but what I really wanted to, to show here is just like how powerful this token ha is, right? Like daily trading volume over 400 million. This was like, I think 20 million or 30 million just like a couple months ago pre-token. And that was during like probably the hotter parts of the market when we were approaching all time highs and stuff like that. And now it's over 400 million because you have these token incentives in play where by trading on there, you do uh, get to earn tokens. Um, and, uh, you know, and obviously there's an airdrop waiting for people and to to uh, claim that airdrop, you actually have to trade on there as well and do some kind of like uh, a volume on it. So there's a lot of incentives to to trade on there. But I don't think this is necessarily a bad thing. This is this, this is just a way to kind of like bootstrap growth of, of a new system, especially something on layer two where most users will not be aware of. And I think it's like, a, a, a it's just, you know, like what we've seen with liquidity mining and stuff like that. What I, what I wanted to focus on is basically how sustainable this sort of stuff is. Because lately we've been seeing a ton of kind of like massive numbers being thrown around for these liquidity mining programs. And it really feels like we're just repeating DeFi Summer 2.0 and especially with other chains. So the other day I saw that Avalanche uh, was giving $180 million worth of their token to Aave and Curve users. Um, and I think maybe some other DeFi apps that were kind of like using it on, on Avalanche. Now we've seen with DeFi Summer in that, you know, people will come for the rewards, right? And not just DeFi Summer on Ethereum, all the stuff that happened on BSC. People will bridge over, they'll, they'll take their money over, they'll farm the rewards and they'll dump it and then they'll go back to where they came from. It's not a sustainable uh, kind of like uh, way to grow an ecosystem, especially when the number's that big because you can't pay that out forever. And, and at the end of the day, pretty much like everyone is just going to be dumping those rewards. There's not many people who actually want to hold those, those tokens. And there's enough people now that have learned just how reflexive that is and just how quickly these tokens can dump from the first DeFi summers that it's just, you know, it's just bizarre to me that we're seeing these other chains do this. And I, I get why they're doing it because they want to bootstrap growth and everything like that. But I look at this and I think to myself, you know, in, in, in a few months time, uh, this is just, they're just going to be ghost chains again. Like people just literally just going for, for the money. I don't see how they're going to accrue like a lasting network effect by doing that. But in saying that, I think DYDX has a pretty good way uh, of doing it with their token. Um, they're doing kind of like this, I guess, I mean, I guess you could call it volume mining where, you know, you you, you trade on their their, um, their exchange here, you earn some tokens as rewards, um, but like there's fees involved too. So the more you trade, the more fees you incur, you know, and you're hoping, I guess, like the tokens offset the fees, but if not, you've kind of like lost out on money, right? It's not just like free money coming from the from the sky here where there's a lot of these other protocols that do give out the, out the free money. So yeah, I think just, just kind of like uh, these protocols and these projects are learning from those mistakes on Ethereum, but I'm seeing this same mistakes just kind of repeated on these other chains. And I'm just hoping it doesn't happen with the layer two ecosystem because obviously when Arbitrum goes live, as Optimism keeps rolling out new projects, as all these other layer twos go live, they're going to want to bootstrap growth. And the, and the fastest way to bootstrap growth is to just like add a token or add token incentives. But as I said, that's good for short-term kind of growth and short-term uh, kind of like usage. But Long term, it's not very sustainable. And I've highlighted things like unincentivized TVL before that, that the index co-op pioneered where essentially it's um, measuring the amount of total value locked in in, 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 in the different products that is not there just to kind of like yield farm or, or to kind of like gain a token reward or whatever, which I think is a better metric to, to measure. But it's kind of hard to do, I guess, sometimes. And, you know, these liquidity mining programs can definitely last for a while as well. Uh, they can last for years, but it just depends how lucrative they are, you know, for them to last for years, you would either have to have constant, uh, massive constant demand side, or you would have to have kind of like a leveling out of, of the rewards. And I think that's what happened with Curve. Curve has had a long-term uh, kind of like liquidity mining uh, program where they're paying out a lot of tokens, right? But they also have like a pretty good token mechanism where they lock up a lot of these tokens for, you know, many years so people can earn more rewards. And, and, and kind of like Curve has had uh, a lot of a lot of just natural usage because they're a stablecoin swap protocol and that's obviously a, a very big deal and something that a lot of people use but generally yeah this is just something that i'm going to be keeping a close eye on because i really want to make sure uh that kind of like we don't repeat the same mistakes when we when we kind of try to go to layer two here um and at the same time i guess like the fact that there's, it's just going to be more scalable means that there's going to be a ton of new projects going kind of going there and launching with liquidity money programs anyway so maybe what i'm saying and what i'm trying to do is a fool's errand but at the end of the day 
it's still good to see that you know the token can be used for growth uh you know it still works but i just really hope that uh, we can create more sustainable kind of liquidity mining programs going forward all right, so just a quick kind of like update here on, I guess, la that infrastructure bill that went through with the crypto, uh, I guess, like regulations that everyone kind of uh, kicked up a fuss about. So this came from like one of these, uh, I guess, like financial news um, Twitter accounts that said uh, the US House of Representative Soto, I don't know what his full name is here, um, Darren Soto, I think that's how you say his name. Um, uh, he's seeking to offer a crypto amendment to the budget measure. So remember how I said that, yes, the infrastructure bill passed through the Senate, but now it has to go through the House. And then if it passes through the House, it has to, it goes through the courts and kind of like you battle it out and then it goes into law in 2023. Um, so we can still have, I mean, we still have kind of people in our on our side in the House here saying they want to offer a crypto amendment to the budget measure to make sure that we can kind of like uh, make those, I guess, like regulations that were put in uh, more palatable and make more sense. So yeah, I'm just monitoring that. I mean, I kind of like quote tweeted it with them. This meme of some green candles coming out of out of roofs here, uh, just because I thought it was a little bit bullish. But uh, yeah, I just thought I'd just give a quick update on that one for you guys. So I put out this tweet today uh, where I said, the amount of opportunities to make money in Ethereum and be part of a community is mind boggling. One thing that I need to come to terms with is that I won't be able to feel fully exposed to the Ethereum ecosystem anymore. My, and my plan is to just keep buying ETH and dope NFTs. This is... I guess today is something that I was really thinking about because I was kind of like, I mean, a lot of stuff happened in the NFT ecosystem today. It was pretty crazy. Like there was a bunch of different kind of like drops and, um, you know, a lot of people were kind of like going crazy still over the punk stuff from, from yesterday with Visa buying a punk and just, I mean, there was so much going on. I'm not going to go through it all, but, you know, from all the chats that I read, people were just like chasing all these NFTs and it was just absolutely crazy. And I started thinking, I'm like, okay, how do I get exposure to the NFT ecosystem without buying the individual NFTs? Obviously, I can't, I, I thought to myself, well, ETH, because ETH kind of like, um, you know, accrues value from all the activity on the network due to the fee burn but like outside of that what else is there i mean there's project tokens like rare and rari from from rareable um and there's probably going to be other ones like that as well out there uh there's the nfts themselves of course but that's much harder to speculate on there's some infrastructure platforms you know immutable x is going to do their token and stuff like that and maybe some of the layer twos if they do a token uh i guess like matic is probably another exposure point there as well just a disclosure i'm an advisor to to polygon i'm not sh trying to shill matic i'm just kind of like going through my thought process here and i was just kind of thinking you know that's that's kind of like the ways to get exposure but at the same time i'm never going to be like fully exposed because if something with something like the nft ecosystem I feel like, I mean, I'm always going to miss something, right? Like, and not just me, like everyone, everyone's always going to miss a drop here or a drop there, especially for us in Australia, we're usually sleeping for these drops. And, you know, you may not come across something until it, the price of it has just skyrocketed and you're kind of priced out of it and, and stuff like that. Because at the end of the day, these NFTs, I mean, yes, you can fractionalize them, but if you want to own a whole NFT, it's like super hard to do. And it's different to kind of like owning a token or part of a token, you know, because a token is just like a fungible thing. And, and it, it doesn't really matter if you own kind of like this token or that token, they're all kind of the same thing there. But with an NFT, if you kind of like, you know, for, for example, if you want a punk right now, I mean, you to buy a whole punk at, at the cheapest one is $250,000. Like that is out of reach for the majority of people. There's only a very few people can kind of like can kind of own something like that uh, unless you bought it early on and you held till now. But if you wanted to buy one as a fresh punk owner, then yeah. And, and this is why we've seen like a lot of these other profile picture kind of, I guess, like NFT projects spin up like Board 8 Yacht Club, Pudgy Penguins. There's so many of them. It's simply because, I mean, one, the the, the people, a lot of people couldn't afford punks and they wanted to be part of a community. Um, and, and and two, I think that, uh, you know, punks aren't going to appeal to everyone too, right? Like it's just one kind of um, thing there. But outside of that, there's also like a bunch of, uh, you know, art pieces and one of ones of artists and stuff you want to buy. It's just, it's going to be impossible to kind of like have exposure to all of that. It's the same with like DeFi. I mean, you can buy the DeFi Pulse Index, but that doesn't include every DeFi token. Um, and, and at the end of the day, like I just was thinking like, how do I get the maximum exposure here? And I really just settled on ETH at the end of the day. Like, yes, I'm going to probably buy other things and try to get involved and, and stuff like that. But just buying ETH and stacking ETH over the long term, which I already do anyway, um, and just buying NFTs that I like, 
I think I'll be content with that because buying NFTs that I like uh, will just kind of like make me happy. I'll be able to support the artist. I'll get like some really dope art that I can display on my mural behind me and stuff like that, right? Um, and and, and kind of like display as part of my digital collection, maybe in the metaverse one day. And then with ETH, kind of like I get broad exposure to it because I mean, I put out my tweet here today that all of this ETH, that NFT activity is actually still burning ETH, right? Like people people have forgotten this already. And I kind of said that, you know, we're, we're now at 82,500 ETH or $275 million burned and 1559 has only been live for 18 days at, at, at time of recording here. And then I went on to say ETH is so incredibly undervalued because I believe it is. And, you know, I've said before that I think that 1559's impact in the short term is is not going to be as as great as its long-term impact. Because, you know, as we keep getting this ETH kind of, I guess, burned and as a lot of it comes from from the market directly because there's a lot of new purchases of ETH, you know, whether they're purchasing it, purchasing it to buy NFTs or participate in DeFi, they have to have it because of gas fees and all that sort of stuff. Um, you know, over the long term, this is going to cause like a supply shock on ETH. And then I, I, I do I do think ETH is going to appreciate a lot from here. But at the end of the day, because all this activity from NFTs is being fee- fed back into ETH, ETH is the perfect thing to get exposure to the whole in NFT ecosystem. But it's, you know, it it, it, it obviously isn't going to give you like, uh, you know, some of the crazy, enormous gains you can get from NFTs if you pick the right NFTs. But picking the right NFT is hard because just say you wanted to pick, I guess, like, you know, the Fidenza NFT, like that's been all the autoglyphs or whatever else. It, those ones that like are going for millions of dollars now, but just a few months ago, we're going for like only maybe tens of thousands, something like that, even less than that. To pick that and to hold it until now and to not sell it too early, I mean, it's just really, really hard. Like most of the people speculating in these NFTs uh, right now are not going to get those insane returns um, and then stuff like that. You may be able to get better returns on on buying, you know, I guess like any NFT during a mania phase, but I'm talking about like the long-term kind of arc here and kind of like the simple, the kind of like simplistic, I guess, investment view is basically for me is that it, um, it, buying ETH makes me feel like I have exposure and then just buying NFTs that I like um, makes me feel good because I'm still involved in the NFT ecosystem, but I'm also I kind of getting exposure via ETH and, and those other NFTs that I like. Maybe they appreciate one day too. I don't know, but it's kind of like how I play it with my, my figurines that I buy. I don't buy them for investment purposes. I buy them because I like them. That's just simple as that. And that's how I'm playing the NFT game right now. But that's not to say that you can't kind of invest and flip NFTs. It's very profitable right now. But just like keeping up with it and, and, and kind of like um, keeping on top of it is pretty much impossible. Even for people who have like a team of people doing it for them, it's it's impossible because there's just too much going on. It's like trying to keep up with the internet, right? It's just it's just crazy. And that just it's not just for NFTs, but it's like for Ethereum in general, like keeping up with all the new DeFi projects, all the new DAOs and social tokens and, you know, all that sort of stuff. It's just, you know, it, it's really, really hard to keep up, keep up with all of it. So if you want a dead simple thing, then, you know, I think it's ETH, not, not an investment advice. But obviously, I think it's ETH because of the fact that all that value is flowing back to ETH through the fee burn, especially, but also because ETH is being used as money within the ecosystem too, right? So you have all of that going on as well. So a Ribbon Finance announced that Ribbon V2, uh, it will be going live soon. So they've basically detailed, uh, you know, what Ribbon V2 is, how it's a huge improvement um, to the current vault and ha- what uh, exciting new features uh, it, it, it introduces here. So the upgrades to the vaults, uh, they're going to be able to, de- to decentralize the vaults. So uh, Ribbon V2, as they say here, has moved away from managed vaults altogether and is now fully autonomous code that does not need human input, which is really cool. Uh, and this is achieved through two new features, algorithm mixed strike selection and open auctions here. They're rebuilding their vault accounting system. They're going to have governable vault parameters here and they'll be officially launching V2, uh, vault, uh, the first V2 vault in the next few weeks and we'll be doing a gradual migration from V1 to V2. So if you've been a Ruben Finance user in the, in the past or you're just interested in seeing what they're all about, I definitely recommend going and checking this out. Um, and just like, I guess I could tell down what they are. They're a, a protocol that offers structured products um, for crypto. So, you know, things like options and, and, and stuff like that, they've been pretty popular with, but um, definitely go check them out if you're interested in that sort of stuff and, and you can get more details about v2 in this blog post so awaki from gitcoin uh basically uh, announced this new project that they did today called moonshot bots and it's basically a profile picture project with with a 303 supply so not the usual 10,000 supply here uh, but essentially all the proceeds from this is going towards supporting public goods and the last i checked it was seven or eight hundred thousand dollars had been 
kind of put towards this. So this is essentially harnessing, I guess, like the NFT degen for good, because this is going towards supporting public goods on the Gitcoin platform, all the ones that we've seen whenever we donate on Gitcoin and stuff like that, um, which I think is really, really cool. And, you know, I think Owiki has been a, a really big fan of doing this for, for quite a while. He, he, he basically calls it regen finance, so regenerative finance, where you harness like the degen energy, all this money flowing around, and you basically use it for public goods funding instead of kind of like using it for just like the super speculative stuff, the greed the, and all that sort of stuff, which I think is really cool. So yeah, unfortunately, you know, um, I woke up to, to this being uh, uh, as usual, like I woke up and this was already kind of launched. And now I think it's like 10 ETH or something to buy one of these things. Um, you know, I'm, I'm definitely kind of like priced out of that there. Um, but yeah, congrats to anyone who got one at a kind of ch cheaper price here. But yeah, I mean, just generally, I think this is really cool because you'll be able to kind of obviously put this as your profile picture if you want, signal that you, you're supporting public goods. Um, and you know, the next Gitcoin grant round is going to be, I think, huge because of this. There's going to have more money to flow around uh, uh, here. So I think that was really cool. So last thing about NFTs, uh, Nifty Island has introduced their uh, kind of like Nifty Blade here. So this is essentially a digital and, and physical blade that people can kind of like bid on as part of an auction here. Um, just full disclosure, I got one of these blades for free because I'm, an, uh, I'm a neon palm holder. Um, but like, I'm not shilling it because of that. I just wanted to kind of highlight it because, um, you know, the reason I got this was because I basically was was one of the early kind of like um, people who participated in this project, found it, early, you know, early on, kind of like, uh, I guess on the refuel kind of highlighted it for you guys as well and I had a couple people messaging me saying thanks because I got one of these palms which are worth a lot of money now so you know I'm pretty happy that I was able to kind of like help people there but essentially uh, this auction's already over but from now on they're going to be auctioning um, more of these blades um, at specific times you know this one was at 4 p.m central time in the U.S. So I'm assuming it's going to be on the same times um, but yeah it, it basically gives you an opportunity to purchase one of these um, these are kind of blades that you see here and as I said there's a physical blade. So you basically get this NFT ticket that you can redeem for a physical blade at a later date. Uh, I'm definitely going to be redeeming, redeeming mine and I, I, I'm putting it like in the background so you guys will be able to see it when I get that. I think this is really cool because, I mean, this is following along with the theme of, I guess, like the um, the hacky sack that Gitcoin did, the uni socks, right? The, there was like DeFi socks. Like this basically this kind of like NFT that you can bid on and get within, um, you know, on chain and then uh, burn it or kind of like redeem it for a physical item that's sent to you and you know Unisox is worth what $150,000 right now which is kind of crazy um, and, and and I think the hacky sacks are worth about maybe thirty dollars or $40,000 something like that um, and yeah there's been a bunch of these uh, kind of like uh, things being done but it's, it's cool to see I guess like a, a katana basically a blade here um, uh, kind of been done because I hadn't seen that before I'm hoping I can actually import this into into Australia once I get it uh, they have pretty strict rules and laws around that but we'll see how that goes um, but on that note I think that's it for today everyone so thank you again for listening and and watching be sure to subscribe to the channel if you haven't yet give that video a thumbs up subscribe to the newsletter join the discord channel and i'll catch you all tomorrow thanks everyone